Hello, you guys. It's Jalen Martinez, AKA the Suburban Grower. And um, today I wanted to talk to you guys about five things, excuse me, five things that you should know before you put a fruit tree in the ground. Um, the reason I am so dedicated to making this video today is, um, like I mentioned before in one of my other videos, I follow a lot of different pages. Um, and I'm not trying to put anybody down whatsoever. That's not who I am um, because this community has to come together to spread information and help um, one another. But however, if, um, if you are on a group, the, um, the idea is to get the right information across because a lot of times um, information is lost in translation and it seems to be a, um, a bigger problem than, um, than it probably should be. Uh, the reason why I feel as if the five things that I'm going to tell you today are most important is because I don't know about you guys, but some people call it a hobby. I tend to call it a lifestyle. Um, for me, it's not so much about the money that I put into this, but it's more so about the time and the effort and um, what goes on behind the scenes that you guys don't get a chance to really see. So with that being said, the first thing that I want to talk to you guys about today is um, a growing zone. <clears throat> The first thing you need to know before you buy any tree, whether it's going into a pot or whether you're planting it in the ground, is what growing zone you're in. Um, it is very simple where well, you may ask, well, how do you find a growing zone? The way to find a growing zone is to, um, for instance, I stay in Killeen, Texas. So I would put Killeen, Texas, growing zone and what that's going to do is it's going to populate a page and it's going to say Colleen Texas growing zone 8b or Phoenix City Alabama growing zone 8a or Sullivan Alabama growing zone 7b um, these are <laughs> some of the cities that I grew up in when I was little so I know these growing zones because I have viewers in Sullivan. I have viewers in Phoenix City. Um, so I just wanted, uh, wanted to show you guys an example. The reason why this is so important is because before you get a tree, you need to know where it's at. I'm kind of leaning into my second one. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce my second reason as to why is um, the second reason or the second thing you need to know is what variety you're getting. Now I can tie the first one and the second one together. So what growing zone you're getting and what variety you're getting ultimately are together. The reason why they're together is because you cannot go out there and buy a tree if you don't know exactly, um, exactly what growing zone you're in. So your growing zone is characterized um, by how cold it gets in your area. So for us, we're in zone 8B, which means the lowest that it normally gets out here is 15 to 20 degrees, which is very important because that means that for me, and I do it anyway, but um, certain citrus varieties cannot make it in my climate. But on the flip side, um, you have trees that are high chill varieties. You have um, you have apple trees and pear trees, some of them that need 850 chill hours, 850 to 1100 chill hours, which means a uh, temperature between 32 and 45 degrees. They have to have at least 850 to 1100 chill hours. Those are called high chill varieties. Now on the flip side, low chill varieties, these are the varieties that you can grow in Arizona, South Texas, South Florida. Um, some is even uh, along the East Coast, some of the beaches. 
these are called low chill varieties and most of these are uh, varieties that only need somewhere between 100 uh, 100 chill hours to about 450 chill hours. Those are considered low chill, uh, low chill varieties. That is very important in knowing um, in knowing what you're going to select because if you were to ever um, if you were to ever select a high chill variety in a low chill area, which is like I said, South Texas. If I had a tree that um, needed a thousand chill hours and I put it in South Texas. It's not going to get that, which in turn, that tree may, uh, that tree will probably not even fruit that coming year. So that's how important it is. And vice versa, if it doesn't get enough chill hours, you may not get enough fruit as well. Okay, so the third is going to be um, how to fertilize your trees. Um, now, I have, I have seen... <laughs> All kind of methods be used to fertilize. Um, I'm not knocking either one of these methods, but there is an organic way and there is a, what I call just the store-bought method. And that is your pre-packaged, uh, all kinds of different fertilizers that they have. Now, some uh, some areas do have, or some, some uh, brands do have organic fertilizing mixes. However, I choose to go all organic and use nothing but um, vegetable waste that I have accumulated. Um, I put it in a little in a little bowl, put a put a lid over it, and that's what we do. This is my coffee grinds, my banana peels, uh, cucumber, potato skin, um, tomatoes, citrus peels. I, I use all of that stuff. That's that's my method of fertilizing, but not just. Um, your method of fertilizing, you need to know, just as I told you back on uh, number one, you need to know how to research what fertilizers your tree needs um, based upon based upon uh, you being able to research it. So for instance, if I had a kefir pear tree, I would say, what um, <laughs> What fertilizer does a kefir pear tree need? Now, you you may be like, well, this is super, super simple. But the reason why it is so important, and I'm gonna bring it all together, the reason why it's so important is because if you went out there and used a lawn fertilizer for your tree, or you used a lawn fertilizer around your tree, there's a very, very real, uh, consequence behind doing so because a lot of those lawn fertilizers are filled filled with high nitrogen um, contents high nitrogen ratios i'm talking most of the time if you were going to fertilize a pear tree i wouldn't recommend going above a 13 13 13 so it's 13 parts nitrogen 13 parts um, potassium and 13 parts magnesium <clears throat> so, uh, if you used a 50, 50, 35, 35, which is something that, or a 50, I'm sorry, or 50, 0, 0, or 50, 0, 0, let me slow down. That means that you have 50 parts nitrogen in that fertilizer that is going straight down to those trees roots. And I'm going to tell you right now, if that tree is not well established, that tree is going to die because that is a super high concentration of fertilizer but uh that's enough on fertilizing the next thing that we're going to move on to is disease control i'm um, not disease control but knowing what diseases your tree is susceptible to for um for a few different varieties of trees I know that apple trees are susceptible to um, certain types of rust. I know that, excuse me, I know that uh, pear trees are susceptible to fire blight. Um, so like I told you in um, two or one and three, numbers one and three, you need to know when you're searching that variety that you see outside of seeing what fruit that tree is going to deliver 
go ahead and do yourself adjust, do yourself some justice and see what, um, what diseases your tree is susceptible to. For me, what I do is I Google it, I figure it out and, um, I stand on it and what you do is I'm not gonna tell you to be that crazy person that walks around the house every single day but I do <laughs> so don't call me crazy but at least every every three to five days circle your house and look at your trees because here's the deal um, and I've seen in some of my groups going back to the groups uh, somebody be like well I haven't checked on my tree in two weeks and uh, as a matter of fact, I seen one that was a pear tree and the lady hadn't checked on it all summer. Um, she just kind of let let nature take its course with it. And it it caught fire blight and it burned every single leaf off of it. Um, I mean, this wasn't a this wasn't a brand new tree. This was a uh, four or five year old tree. So to make it real, five, four years of taking care of a tree and one year, not even one year, I'm sorry, one summer of not taking care of it can heal your tree. So make sure you know what's going on. Um, it's, it's very simple to find out what diseases your trees are susceptible to. I have two pear trees, I have two apple trees, and um, those are the ones for me that tend to have the most issues. Um, Another thing to really research, and I know this is not, I said five, but I'm, I'm still on four. The real thing that helps you, um, the thing that helps you see what diseases your trees are resistant to is really researching what rootstock is on your tree. And like I mentioned before, the rootstock is the actual root that that scion is growing on. So you have what makes your tree, uh, what controls your trees. The rootstock controls your tree's height. It controls your tree's disease resistance. And uh, ultimately it determines how hardy your tree is. The scion is the desirable fruit, which I said before, like if you wanted a kefir pear, you're gonna take that Bradford rootstock, that Bradford, uh, the, it's called the ornamental pear, you know? So we're gonna take that ornamental pear root and then we're gonna take that kefir pear and put it inside of that rootstock. And now you have your desired, uh, your desired fruit, which is the kefir pear. So research your rootstock as well. The last one, and probably the most important, and these kind of go hand in hand um, with uh, fruit production and rootstock, that sort of thing. The last one is how to prune your tree. So we just covered diseases and this, that, and other. I have actually had in real time uh, this year a tree that was ridden by uh, fire blight. And if I wouldn't have caught it, it could have spread throughout my whole tree. I have a Bartlett pear and I have an Ayers pear. I want a moon glow, but I don't have enough space on my land to get that. So I'm not going even I'm not even going to venture out into that. But uh, I went ahead and, and this is what I was just mentioning before. I was checking my trees like I do, um, if not every day, every other day. And I started seeing those leaves kind of burnt up on my Bartlett pear. So I came out with my pruning shears. I pruned that little piece off and um, covered it up real good with some ivory organics and we called it a day. So pruning is not just how to shape your tree. Okay, well, it is shaping your tree. It's shaping your tree for the future. Uh, it's cutting off any dead, diseased wood. Um, ultimately, uh, with citrus, actually pruning trees, pruning your citrus trees makes them uh, flush with new growth. It makes them flush with flowers. And that is an absolutely uh, great technique to use whenever you're looking for um, your fruit to come come on through. Um, the biggest thing with uh, pruning for me is looking at not this year, not next year, not three years from now necessarily, but looking at 
five to 10 years what the shape of that tree is gonna be. And you may say, well, that's not something I'm concerned about right now. I just want it to be taken care of right now. You may not be concerned now, but in the future, you will absolutely, absolutely be thankful that that tree um, that you went ahead and cut it. I know it's painful to see that tree be sliced up and diced and this, that, and other, but I can tell you, whenever you cut it, it makes those branches stronger because if you cut off the tip of a branch, that, that branch is done growing. That branch is gonna harden off. Now what happens is that branch that you cut off at the tip right here is going to branch on this side and it's gonna branch on that side. So this branch is done, but you need those branches to harden off before, um, before they start sprouting out new, um, new growth so that they can support the weight of those fruit. Now this is especially concerning when you have um, apple trees, pear trees, and um, apple trees, pear trees, and peach trees. The reason why I say this is because some of the varieties of apples, pears, and uh, peaches can produce over two to 400 pounds on a fully mature tree. Um, so if you decided not to take a branch that you should have 10 years ago and you get that bumper crop of of pears or you get that bumper crop of peaches or you get that bumper crop of uh of apples and what a bumper crop is is a lot of um a lot of fruit at one time um you're gonna you're gonna snap your tree you're gonna snap your tree or you're gonna snap your tree's branches i have seen people that say well you know i don't wanna i don't wanna bother my tree i just wanna see it grow and and I'm just gonna let nature take its course. Okay. Something that you don't do in a tree's earlier stages will eventually come back to haunt you. Um, I have one tree that it, it's not at any fault of my own, but my peach tree, I'm, I already know. It's nothing I can do. Um, it was bought like this from the nursery, but they cut they cut one side of, um, it was it was shaped like a Y. They cut one of the branches and the whole tree is now, it's not like this, it's like that. So all of the weight is at about a, I would say probably a 25 degree angle. So what I'm looking at now is going ahead and finding out a way to cut this thing whenever it goes dormant to where the weight that shifted over here can be balanced out by the weight of the fruit. So again, that was no part on that was that wasn't on my part because if I well hindsight twenty twenty I would have probably just cut it down to about twenty four inches and let it grow out and do its thing um, after the fact. But um, that's information that I didn't know. You see what I'm saying? But now I know and see <clears throat> by. By the way that they cut it prematurely uh, with the nursery, it messed up the natural flow of the tree, which is now something I'm going to have to figure out how to fix. But going forward, if you see something that's going to um, that's going to uh, cause problems later on, you might want to take care of it now because it will be extremely hard for that. 30, I mean, this is this is a stretch, but. Some, sometimes people do get properties um, that have trees planted that are that have been in the ground 20 and 30 years. Um, whenever me and my wife decide to move out of our home and rent it or sell it in the future, um, that will be the that will be the exact case, you know. So if I if I don't take care of them now, then somebody else is going to have to take care of them, and they're probably Nine times out of 10, they're not gonna know what to do with them. But uh, you guys, I don't wanna go off on the rant on my last point, but I hope I'm driving home these points. Like I said, these aren't exactly the only five things you need to know. They're not the best five in any particular order, but these are some of the basic things that you guys need to know um, before you go forward and um, 
plant a tree, whether that be in a pot or in the ground. I say it in the ground because um, that tree is going to be exposed to the elements at every single or every single day of its life. So I wanted you guys to have basically a uh, a guide on how to um, ultimately take care of your tree. Um, if you have any questions, comments, or concern, you guys um, make sure you comment down there. If you have any, um, if you have anything else, I'll include my email in this link. If you guys need to reach out to me, feel free to do so. Uh, it's Jalen Martinez, aka the Suburban Grower, and I am out. You guys have a blessed one.